First of all, hello and uh, thank you to Professor Dr. George Tamer and Dr. Katja Turner for the invitation to uh, present uh, the conference today that is organized by the Lehrstuhl für Orientalische Philologie und im Islamwissenschaft. Um, I'm in the interesting position of presenting not just the Jewish side of things, but to be the first in our small group to present on tolerance. If I understand correctly, I'm also the first to present on any of the concepts that our project director has selected for us to cover. I want to start with the question of why start with tolerance? No, I don't want to start with the question of why start with tolerance, why that is the first concept we are dealing with. Um, in order for that question to be raised, we need first to know what the concept entails and whether, and if so, it is apt to describe phenomena that are indigenous to, or at least familiar and somehow meaningful from within all three of the traditions this project groups together as Relanda or Comparanda. And so, in other words, I won't be the one asking the question at all, why start with tolerance? That has to wait until we are done with, with, the, with the conference. A few preliminary remarks. Uh, first, the assumption at work here and in many similar comparative endeavors is that Judaism, Christianity and Islam constitute a family of religions or a constellation of symbolic clusters that are both similar and different enough from one another to be meaningfully juxtaposed. I recently completed a brief history of Jerusalem that proceeds on the assumption that just about anything we know about Jews, Christians and Muslims is in flux in two regards, namely in regard of our knowledge of the historical, textual, ritual and material evidence of the phenomena themselves and in regard to our categories that seem to dissolve the historical phenomena into mere chimerae of, of self-reflection. At points where Jewish, Jewish and Muslim, or Jewish and Christian, or Christian and Muslim, as well as Hindu and Muslim practices intersect, for example at local shrines venerated by Jews and Muslims or Hindus and Muslims alike, the question of the identity of venerator and venerated cannot easily be reduced to the grand labels we use to classify people as either this or that. A famous case of this sort, which led to the legal classification of the followers of the Aga Khan as Muslim, was aptly described in a book by my colleague Tina Purohit here at Boston University. In her study, the British need to divide the populations of India into distinct religious groups obscured precisely those aspects of religion that are practiced by actual people and that defy easy identitarian classifications. A second preliminary remark. I am not sure that Jews or Judaism, in whatever sense, deserve the exposed position it enjoys in this and similar ent enterprises of comparison. I understand the gesture of giving pride of place to what is assumed to be the oldest of the three monotheistic traditions and hence in some sense the origin of its great others, Christianity and Islam. We are familiar with the tropes of mother religion and her daughters, a trope that was particularly attractive to the liberal Jews of the 19th century for whom religion had become a historical phenomenon to be studied from a historical perspective and who took some consolation for the socially inferior position of the Jews from their historical Prius over the imperial cults that had put them in that place and still to some extent kept them there. In an age where historical Prius meant historical origin, old age was a sweet revenge on the epigones. In more recent scholarship on late antique and medieval Judaism, the phenomena of Jewish ritual prayer, mystical visions, philosophical thought, and other aspects of Jewish thought and practice tend to be considered as co-emergent with comparable trends in Christian and Islamic realms that provided the imperial context for a certain flourishing of Jewish ideas and practices rather than always only stifling Jewish existence. In other words, just as today the Jews of the past 
who produced significant bodies of commentary and philosophical reasoning, did so, did so in conversation, not just with other Jews or solely on the basis of antecedent Jewish traditions, but with the non-Jewish worlds that surrounded them and of which they were a part. We need to remember that the ghetto was both a late and relatively short-lived experience in, in Jewish history. More distinctive in recent centuries, informing still familiar ways of being Jewish are the experiences of expulsion, migration and social isolation that characterize the formation of distinctly Eastern European Jewish identities. While episodic, the centuries of Jewish flourishing in Eastern Europe left the Jews with certain assumptions about Gentile hostility and Jewish otherness that we still struggle to overcome today. This brings me to the historical point at which the call for toleration encountered the Jews and vice versa. With this I enter the main body of my presentation, which will be twofold, namely, one, toleration and the Jews, and two, Jews and the virtue of tolerance. So, number one, toleration and the Jews. Let us begin by remembering that the notion of toleration came to the Jews from the outside. It came to them, at least in modern times, as a Christian idea. This is not to ignore the fact that the first monotheistic dispensation that used a type of tolerance to organize a plurality of uh, acceptable faith traditions was early Islam. I'm sure we will hear more about this later on from our colleague, Professor Anna Akasoy. The reason why I start with the European idea of toleration is because it gives us the terminology we were asked to work with for this project. I'm nevertheless inclined to think that we can have the substance of tolerance or toleration without the term itself and that the political principle of toleration may well describe the considerations and practical politics at work in the organization of the caliphate from its inception as Arab minority rule over vast regions populated by a plurality of non-Arabs and non-Muslims down to the multi-ethnicity of the Ottoman Empire. But let me return to Europe. A quick and very preliminary search for the origin of the English usage of toleration in the sense of a political forbearance of religious difference came up with the following observations. According to the online etymology dictionary, toleration, meaning forbearance, sufferance, is from the 1580s, but there's no evidence given. The specific religious sense is from 1609, again there's no evidence given, so I cannot cite it, as in the Act of Toleration of 1689, a statute granting freedom of religious worship with conditions, to dissenting Protestants in England. In this it means, quote, recognition of the right of private judgment in matters of faith and worship, liberty granted by the government to preach and worship as one pleases, equality under the law without regard to religion, end quote. And again, no source is given for the quotation. Um, looking more specifically at the Toleration Act, of May 24, 1689, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica on online, uh, this Toleration Act was an act of Parliament granting freedom of worship to non-conformists, that is, dissenting Protestants such as Baptists and Congregationalists. It was one of a series of measures that firmly established the uh, Glorious Revolution in England, 1688-89. The Toleration Act demonstrated that the idea of a comprehensive Church of England had been abandoned and that hope lay only in toleration of division. It allowed, it allowed non-conformists their own places of worship and their own teachers and preachers, subject to acceptance of certain oaths of allegiance. This is important, of course, in the story of the Jews and emancipation because of the question of the Jewish oath. Social and political disabilities remained however, and nonconformists were still denied political office, as were Roman Catholics. Um, Jews were at that point not yet officially admitted back to England. 
Uh, that led to the practice of occasional conformity, but in 1711, the Occasional Conformity Act imposed fines on anyone who, after receiving Anglican communion, was found worshipping at non-conformist meeting houses, etc. We see how the, this act did not apply to Roman Catholics and Unitarians. So in other words, the big question in late 17th century England was whether toleration, that is forbearance of the state for beliefs and practices deviating from the Anglican Church could be extended only to the variety of Protestant sects or also to the Catholics. Um, at just about the same time, John Locke famously wrote his letters on toleration, first in 1685 and then in 1689. Uh, so just around the time when the Edict of Nantes was lifted and uh, France started persecuting the Huguenots. Um, by the way, in the essay on Locke from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Locke defines toleration as, quote, a lack of state persecution. So it's a purely negative definition of toleration, lack of state persecution. Something that today we might define as legalization, that is, uh, we write in the States, we have debates on the legalization of marijuana, which means the, 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 you, you are allowed to consume it. Um, at some point there is a question, can you also sell it and grow it? Um, all of this is uh, still not quite fully implemented, but there is a ten tendency toward legalization. Um, toleration as legalization of certain but not all religious views or practices uh, is therefore an antecedent to what in the American tradition is called religious liberty, but it is still not quite the same thing. Religious liberty is a qualitative, qualitatively a, a jump to a different level of, of toleration. The Jews enter the purview of the European toleration debate almost as soon as it begins. In 1655, Menasseh ben Israel appeals to Oliver Cromwell to readmit the Jews to England. John Toland, soon after that, argues for the naturalization of the Jews in Great Britain and Ireland. In 1753, so quite a while later, the Houses of Parliament of Great Britain passed the so-called Jew Bill, exempting the Jews residing in His Majesty's American colonies from partaking, partaking in the Lord's Supper as a condition of naturalization. In 1779, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing publishes Nathan der Weise with its parable of toleration. And in 1781, Prussian nobleman Christian Wilhelm von Dohm, like Lessing, a friend of the German Socrates Moses Mendelssohn, uh, pens his treatise on the amelioration of the civil status of the Jews on the, uh, über die bürgerliche Verbesserung der Juden. Uh, in 1782, Joseph II promulgates an edict of toleration for the Jews in Habsburg territories. This is the first legal act of toleration of the Jews anywhere um, within Europe itself. Uh, here's a little bit of background on that edict of toleration, um, also from the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, in German called the Toleranz Patent, issued in 1789 was a law promulgated by the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II granting limited freedom of worship to non-Roman Catholic Christians and removing civil disabilities to which they had been previously subject in the Austrian domain. So this, this is a protection for the Protestants first and foremost, while maintaining a privileged position for the Catholic Church. In an edict of January 2nd, 1782, sometimes also called the Toleranz Patent, Joseph regulated the status of Jews in the Habsburg M uh, territories, freeing them from many discriminatory, discriminatory restrictions. That's a brief summary from the Britannica. Finally, with the French Revolution of 1789 and the Declaration of Rights of Men and of the Citizen of August 26 of that year, the floodgates are open for public debates and soon also the first decrees of citizenship rights for Jews. It is noteworthy that it was a Catholic country that first reached this conclusion. The full emancipation of the Jews across European states and principalities ensued even though in fits and starts over the course of the 19th century. It came with anti-Jewish riots and periods of violent backlash, but eventually gave rise to a more general discourse 
on the protection of national minorities that was also exported to other places and became part of the mission civilisatrice of British, French and other colonial powers, justifying their meddling in the inner affairs of less enlightened states and empires around the globe. Um, in particular, of course, the Ottoman Empire of the time. Once the debate had shifted to the question of the universal rights of men and liberal utilitarian definitions of the rights of citizens, the early discourse on toleration became obscured. To be sure, it is by no means forgotten and the limits of toleration remain a main point of interest to right-wing nationalistic or neo-romantic movements all over the globe today, movements that have long labeled the idea of tolerance that extends beyond the boundaries of white Christians as Judaized. In other words, in the anti-toleration, anti-pluralism, anti-globalism movements of today, Jews remain eminently associated with the idea of tolerance as a bad, slippery slope idea leading to national or ethnic or religious alienation and nivelization of fundamental differences between creeds and races. Toleration or tolerance is a complicated topic for Jews and Judaism precisely because of the long and fraught history of Jewish emancipation. Part of this history is the peculiar change charges against the Jews that were leveled by right-wing pamphleteers like Richard Wagner as well as by left-wing anti-Semites such as Bruno Bauer and Karl Marx. Jews were and still are equally attacked from the left and from the right, although for different reasons. For the left, the Jews pursue their emancipation without being willing to relinquish their collective identity. In other words, they prefer collective toleration to in individual integration. For the right, the Jews are incompatible with the Christian state and hence their legal emancipation and even toleration hastens the demise of the Christian state. I will set aside for now the complicated renewal of anti-Jewish rhetoric on both the left and the right over the last few decades, effectively since the Six-Day War of 1967, a rhetoric focused on Israel but affecting Jews everywhere. Suffice it to say that for many people Israel has become a pariah state and a whipping boy much like the Jewish question had functioned across Europe in the 19th century with a focus of ideological and practical debate centered on questions of citizenship rights and national identity. So with this I turn to my second part, uh, Jews and tolerance. Again a few preliminary thoughts that will need to be considered further on even though probably not today. Whether we start from the European debate on toleration or from other including ancient usages of the term, we should note that the term tolerance hovers between legal, collective and individual, between legal and collective and individual moral phenomena. Toleration, the forbearance or lack of persecution, or more positively the permission of religious difference, as a legal political act has ancient antecedents. For example, in the concept of a religio licita. It should be noted that Tertullian's use of this term to describe the status of the Jews in Roman society is not without self-interest. In some ways it anticipates or should provoke the same consideration of collective self-interest that the Jewish emancipation debate of the 19th century evoked, though in Tertullian's case the self-interest is that of a then still disadvantaged Christian who wanted nothing more than to be treated by the Roman state as equivalent to a Jew. The question to be asked then is whether there are antecedents to the modern usage of toleration that precede the Christian case. To formulate more generally, were ancient Jews or others confronted with the problem that is later summed up in the term toleration? If not, then what distinguishes ancient configurations of sameness and difference in matters of religion and state from their modern eras? Secondly, we need to ask whether toleration is always only a matter of state religion and pluralism management, or whether it is also a less public, perhaps communal or private virtue, a kind of regulated, habituated, uh, habitual or spontaneous patience and capacity to suffer different ways of being in the world that goes beyond matters of religion but may be acutely raised in the case of differences in the interpretation of practice 
uh, of a religion. For example, even if two different Jewish customs, say Sephardic and Ashkenazi rites of prayer or food habit, are considered valid on principle, will those be tolerated within the same synagogue or neighborhood? Or what would tolerance mean with regard to more or less strict interpretations of Sabbath laws? Is there a Jewish, Christian or Muslim predisposition toward tolerance or intolerance? How tolerant are secular Jews of Jewish religious practices and vice versa? What are the boundaries in any given case between public and private behavior, and how are those boundaries policed? What are our limits of toleration? The term that comes to mind here is Paul's term of adiaphora, things that matter little when it comes to questions of life and death, salvation and condemnation. Is there an equivalent to adiaphora in our Jewish languages? And how important is the linguistic milieu for shaping the limits of tolerance? For example, are Yiddish speakers more tolerant than Ladino speakers? I doubt it. Here are a few eminent cases, moments, passages that might lend themselves to an investigation of tolerance as a native concept or a problem thematized within Jewish texts and contexts. And I have a list here of um, 10 different areas of in inquiry that might then be treated in the, in the essay that ultimately we are supposed to, to produce. So this is just really a, a, a few highlights on uh, where we might look for tolerance or examples. And of course, uh, since we're dealing with Judaism, we would start with the Bible. And the first case that comes to mind, or at least to my mind, is the zeal of Pinchas, who spears an Israelite man and his uh, Midianite uh, lover in their tent uh, because of this, the uh, uh, sin of the Baal Peor, as it says in the bo Book of Numbers. Um, is this zeal a case of I religious intolerance? Maybe it is the first case of religious intolerance. But it is a case that is, of course, praised. That is, Pinchas is made a model priest it is in his lineage that the priesthood continues. Um, how does that compare and contrast with what seems to be the tolerance implied in the laws of Leviticus, where it says, one law obtains between you and the stranger who lives among you, uh, where it says, love the stranger as you love thyself. Um, are these in fact, in fact, are these laws in fact expression of tolerance? as they deal with the inclusion of strangers or of, of sojourners and temporary residents, or are they a form of impressing legal conformity on temporary residents? In other words, an expression of legal intolerance. That's my first, that's the first question. The second, the second area of investigation would be prophetic literature and the question of prophetic tolerance or intolerance. Um, I have to say that as I was preparing for this talk, um, prof prophetic intolerance came more easily to my mind than cases of prophetic tolerance. I'm still not quite sure there are any. Uh, maybe in the discussion you can bring some to my attention. Um, I was reminded of Elijah and the, um, uh, the, the competition between Elijah and the priests of Baal on Mount uh, Hermon, uh, Mount Carmel, sorry, not Hermon. Uh, where it seems to me that the outcome is very clear, clearly one of intolerance because God himself was unwilling to hear or the, the Baal, uh, the response of Baal or the Baalim to the priest of Baal was a non-response. The response of the God of Israel to Elijah was an, an affirmation and a confirmation which Elijah takes as a permission to slaughter the priest of Baal. That clearly is a case of intolerance, religious intolerance. Um, we also have, of course, extended um, satirical poems in, the pro in Prophet Isaiah and elsewhere against uh, idols. So idol worship is treated with intolerance, satire, 
Uh, but is satire an indication of intolerance, or is it in fact an indication of the opposite? That is, we cannot get rid of those Baalim, but we can make fun of them. The third case is one that was highlighted in a recent paper published uh, twice, once in a publication in Cairo and the second time in a publication here at Boston University um, by Jan Asman, who of course is famous for having raised the hypothesis that it was the Jews who introduced what he calls the mosaic distinction by carrying the difference between truth and falsehood into the realm of religion where until then they were simply absent. Uh, that it was Judaism or the Bible or somebody related to the Bible, somebody interpreting the Bible, who ultimately uh, has to answer for the fact that what used to be mutual translatability from one cult to another became an exclusive enterprise where there is a true, re true religion that makes all the other religions appear false. And, and for, um, for Asman, this is the beginning of religious intolerance, in fact, of religion and violence. Um, but in this recent paper, he has shifted from blaming Moses himself for the introduction of the, the Mosaic tradition to uh, the Maccabees. Uh, in First Maccabees, in the story of Mattathias, you have a retrieval of the story of Pinchas, uh, in the act of Mattathias himself, who spears a, an, uh, a Jew who is tempted to engage in, in a transgressive act of uh, consuming uh, uh, meat that has been sacrificed to, to the idols. And that is the beginning of the Maccabean revolt, which in the end leads to the establishment of the Hasmoneans as high priests. So, of course, there is a in self-interest in that narrative. Um, but it is certainly a possibility that it is this repetition of the story of Pinchas that first establishes uh, intolerance as state policy. So we have to look at the story of the Maccabees again um, and try to figure out whether their zeal for the ancestral laws is indeed unprecedented and introduces a new phenomenon into the world of religious a discourse or, or w whether it can be read otherwise. Um, of course, the way Asman poses the question is whether the Jews or whether the Bible, at least, is to some extent the origin of religious intolerance. Uh, four. Another area I would like to in investigate uh, with regard to the question of, of tolerance and intolerance is, is apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is famously dualistic. Uh, we have wonderful cases, especially in Qumran, of the um, battle, the war scroll of the battle of the children of light against the children of darkness, where violence and, and ultimate absolute difference between the good and the evil people um, becomes the guiding metaphor to describe the place of the community vis-a-vis uh, -vis the apocalyptic resolution of history. Um, I would say this carries a pretty obvious element of intolerance with it. Um, so the question of apocalyptic dualism and intolerance to the extent, so the question would be to what extent does, is it apocalyptic the apocalyptic imagination that carries an element of ultimate intolerance into um, the rhetoric of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Um, on the other hand, we have to keep in mind that apocalypticism was originally employed by people who had zero political influence, who were outsiders, who, though they cast themselves as the righteous few, um, had no chance to actually accomplish that big redemptive act, the comeuppance of the powerful on their own, they were entirely dependent on divine intervention. In other words, even though you may see the words, the world in strictly and radically dualistic terms, if you follow the apocalyptic logic, you yourself don't have the right to usher in the end. It is God's intervention that is needed in order to bring about the end. The whole the, the other characteristic of apocalyptic literature is the utter passivity of the human righteous whose greatest act in all of this can only be martyrdom, not uh, killing. 
So uh, it, that may, of course, be simplistic, but um, uh, it raises the question to what extent these revenge fantasies, um, what, what is their place within our canons, in our religious uh, traditions? Are they marginal? Are they central? When do they become central? Um, and it is true, there is a certain danger in canonizing the, the revenge fantasies of the weak and the powerless. And it leads us to this uh, famous idea of Friedrich Nietzsche, who argues that it was Judaism that was the original religion of resentment, and uh, the Christians essentially inherited that idea uh, from the Jews. So there was point number four, the apocalyptic imagination. Um, number five would be to look at Rabbinic Judaism, especially early Rabbinic Judaism, the Mishnah, as a kind of depoliticization of uh, Jewish uh, self-definitions. Um, I would tend to follow Jacob Neusner's description of r early Rabbinic Judaism, of the early Rabbinic Judaism of the Mishnah in particular, as one where the boundaries of solidarity that define who is part of Israel are uh, ideal, they are unpoliced, they are open, that is, they are created so as for people of different locations and affiliations to be able to count themselves as part of Israel. It's not exclusionary, it's more open than one might think. Um, I would try to connect this in particular with an interpretation of the famous passage in Sanhedrin 10, which is, seems to say exactly the opposite, namely to limit membership in all Israel, when it says all Israel have a share in the world to come, uh, except for, and one of the exclusions here is uh, those who deny that resurrection is a principle or a cornerstone of the Torah. So all Israel have a share in the world to come, except A, B, and C, um, but you see that, that, the, that the membership that is limited is the membership in the world to come, not in Israel. So there's actually a great deal of tolerance for what may in, be included in this conception of Israel, even though the rabbis want to exclude certain people from access to the world to come, which to them, of course, is very, very important. Um, uh, but you have a very famous example in the, in the Tananitic world, which is um, the so-called uh, Acher, the other, the one who goes over to the other side. Uh, his name was Elisha ben Abuya, and he was the teacher of Rabbi Meir, one of the most important sources of rabbinic law in the Mishnah. Um, and in some cases, there, there are halachot cited in the name of Elisha ben Abuya, even though he was considered a heretic and an Epicurean, and therefore an unbeliever but his halachot are nevertheless accepted. And that is a paradox that deserves to be considered very carefully as who is in, who is out, what are the boundaries, the limits of toleration within the rabbinic orbit. Um, and it, it is certainly a, a remarkable case worth considering. Um, I have a few more such points and I just want to highlight them very quickly and then I'll be done with my presentation and you can shut off the uh, machine and we can have a direct conversation on FaceTime, uh, God willing. Uh, number six on my list of ten is tolerance and Jewish philosophy. It seems to me that the Jewish philosophers, especially Maimonides, uh, argues for a kind of uh, intellectual aristocracy that may or may not exceed the boundaries of faith communities. That is, there is a certain solidarity, a communication across the boundaries of people tied to their um, native traditions um, that philosophy affords, especially when it comes to truth. You are to accept the truth from whoever says it, whether it's Aristotle, who was a Greek, or whether it's Averro, uh, Ibn Rushd, or whether it's somebody else, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, um, it doesn't matter. If it's true, it's true. Um, and yet, he is a loyal member of the community of those who are obedient to Moses, our master, and where philosophy does not give you an unambiguous answer on fundamental questions, he, of course, uh, underscores the, the validity and the necessary acceptance of 
of the opinion of Moses, our master, as an opinion, uh, which is important for public order. So, so Maimonides has a lot to say about how to negotiate questions of truth, questions of public order, um, and this will need to be examined as to what he can tell us about tolerance. Uh, number seven on my list of ten, so I'm almost done, is the question of tolerance in Jewish mysticism. Uh, here I would say we have, what, what we're dealing with in Jewish mysticism is a kind of ontological aristocracy of the Jewish body um, or the Jewish soul, whichever uh, one might prefer. Uh, the Jewish body politic is an assembly of souls originally present at Sinai, which gives the Jews, according to Jewish mystical traditions, a certain ontological dignity and a, an obligation to funnel divine powers of redemption uh, to the cosmos. That is, the Jews themselves have a kind of ontological dignity within the cosmic, cosmic system of emanations, um, which puts them, at least potentially, potentially above uh, the non-Jews who were not at Sinai. Um, I would say that this doctrine gives rise to a kind of exclusionary worldview that uh, is perpetuated where Jewish mysticism is taught. Um, it is both stimulating for, um, for Jewish ritual practices and uh, mystical devotions, but it is at the same time something that uh, underscored and enhanced tendencies towards self-isolation of the Jews for whom the non-Jews then appear as mere shadows, as non-real people, in fact not people at all. Uh, and that is a very dangerous, um, at least from the, from, from the idea, if, if, if we embrace the idea of toleration as a kind of uh, solidarity um, building element in across humanity, I would say that, that this element of mystical ex uh, exclusivity and aristocracy is, is something we need to, to be very careful with. On that note, which is then number eight, um, we have to interrogate questions of social intercourse between Jews and non-Jews, especially out of the world of Eastern European uh, 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 Jewry. Uh, um, Jacob Katz in uh, wrote a book on, on tolerance uh, that examines exactly that question, to what extent were the Jews of Eastern Europe able to extend solidarity to the non-Jews um, and therefore show themselves as tolerant of non-Jewish conduct, non-Jewish humanity, and to what extent they were really um, cultivating a culture of exclusivity, um, which bumps up, of course, in the 19th century against the idea of Jewish cosmopolitanism, which is a very different idea. So in a kind of, it's a question of Jewish anthropologies. Um, I then, in number, ten, number nine, I want to examine the question of inner Jewish tolerance and intolerance. Um, an eminent case I looked at in, in recent or not so recent work was the laws of Keruv, that is to what extent are Jews obliged to bring people who are of Jewish extraction closer to the practice of halakha. Um, it's an obligation, it's a halachic obligation. At the same time it, it very often comes along with utter contempt for Jews who eat shellfish. Um, in other words uh, you can find the expression of utter intolerance for non-observant Jews among uh, observant Jews. Um, but then there are halachic stipulations that should create not tolerance but the desire or the obligation to reach out and to walk across these um, intuitively deep divides between people. Uh, number 10, finally, the question of ethno-apostasy, the question of Jewish identity as membership in the Jewish people. And the question of boycott, divestment and sanctions, that is the charge that if you criticize Israel, you're seen as an anti-Semite, whether you're a Jew or not. And so the limits of, of solidarity among Jews and the new intolerance between uh, uh, Jews that seems to, that Dov Waxman cleverly called trouble in the tribe, 
um, and there are things of that sort to be examined um, that are very contemporary issues about inner Jewish debates on what is within the limits of what can be tolerated and what must not be tolerated. Um, this also then returns us from questions of private conduct to questions uh, of public expressions of opinions um, and politics, Jewish politics, and the question of the limits of tolerance. Um, so that's my remarks for today. Um, I hope, no, I trust we have time for conversation. So um, thank you very much for your attention, and we will speak in a moment. Thank you very much.